this panel is about really changing the world, okay? What good can be done with the technology? And we mean, obviously, blockchain. But to start off with, I'd like to ask you um, a different question, which is, what is good? It's a highly that? subjective answer, right? It's the idea of, and I, I think this is where we actually get into the complexity of looking at the variation that we're going to see in the future of these community economies. Before? Yeah. I'm so sorry, I'm so rude. Would you uh, mind uh. introducing yourself, <laughs> saying what you care about? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, hi, do I have lipstick on my teeth? No, <laughs> didn't do a check before. <laughs> my name is Tony Lane. Uh, I am, so my focus in life is actually bettering the human purpose and helping people to find that purpose. And the work that I am accomplishing in the blockchain space to do that is uh, global citizenship and effectively uh, bridging the transition for different communities out of nation states and into more local economies. And I have a few different initiatives that I'm working on in different areas with indigenous nations in Puerto Rico and in other places uh, to try and really create open source models for universal access to resources like housing, healthcare, different forms of economy. So awesome. uh, that is what I work on. My company is called Culture and I'm very excited to be here, very excited to see you all. And what is good? So it's a really subjective answer and I think we're going to see this translate into the idea of the way that we think about local relationships to economies. Because, for example, someone might say, I believe in democracy and someone might say, I believe in Shahira law. And are either of those people wrong? I think that would be a highly subjective judgment. And I think to say that one person's belief is inherently wrong is to do something that is, that is less good than the idea of saying which belief is right or wrong. Yesterday, uh, was it yesterday, I think, when we, I first heard you ask a question from the audience, <laughs> I remarked that I think we could run a conference the, on the, the question. The first day. That, that was <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. That was the first day. <laughs> uh, but, but that's great. Okay, so maybe that's a good start. Um, you know, Catherine, you, you, we heard from you a little bit earlier. Do we have to know what bad is in order to understand good or appreciate good better? Do we have to know what? I just know what bad is. Oh, oh, you heard my answer. That's <laughs> you, no, I did it, really. That's amazing. <laughs> that was actually my answer, that uh, good is not bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very philosophical. I'm, I'm a agree with Tony in here. Uh, so I think that good is something that makes you feel good and something that does not harm another people. Let's Lovely go with that. definition yeah. of that. I'm going to go with that one. Oh, thank you. I might <laughs> yep. actually tell that to my um, uh, children and grandchildren. Oh, oh thank uh, you. I need some of those, by the way. <laughs> I'm waiting for them. Uh, Reese, um, is, is that, uh, firstly, would you mind introducing yourself and some of the, uh, the, the things that you, you're involved with? Uh, and then maybe have a go at that answer. Okay. <laughs> well, my, my name's Reese Jones, and I uh, help start Singularity University, which is an impact Ooh. organization. <laughs> and uh, the, I, I think this question of good or bad is a, a matter of perspective. And so um, from the point of view of, say, a citizen, uh, it's good if you pay less taxes. And the, from the point of view of the government, it's good if you pay more taxes. <laughs> and so in both cases, those are conflicting uh, uh, views on the same result, paying taxes, or an employer or an employee, uh, similar kind of thing. So the, the, what's good and bad is, is a, uh, subjective depending on your perspective, if you're the person or if you're the organization or government or employer. And so these kind of things, when you start to evaluate data and you start to evaluate the internet, what's good and bad uh, isn't only from the personal perspective, it's also from the social perspective. That's so, so. true. Andres, we, we just heard your presentation, which is, so you're, you're probably okay not to introduce yourself again. Um, but I think that... <laughs> I, I'd like to ask you about, uh, it's, it's interesting, I asked you what you care about and what, what things, what can, you know, what can do good using that technology. And you said, well, I care about Bitcoin. Yeah. So, so, is, can, <laughs> so is Bitcoin good? Um, yeah, first of all, I didn't say what I think of good, so <laughs> that's already an assumption <laughs> built in. in there. But... Uh, I wouldn't even say uh, what, what good is because that's a philosophical question up in the air for 2,000 years. Just between us, there's no um, one else <laughs> listening. <laughs> yeah, just between us, it's probably like um, uh, what can, like the m maximum happiness of our future for, as a society, like the, the integral function of the future happiness of our 
of everyone. You you formularized <laughs> good. Yeah. You heard it here first. That's yeah, awesome. That, that, but that, that was really <laughs> on the fly. That was really on the fly. I love that. <laughs> but now tell us about Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. Is it good? Can it be used for good? Um, even though the fees are ridiculous. <laughs> Sorry, just couldn't help that. The fees are Sorry. ridiculous for now, but Lightning Network is coming. Uh, no, I just wanted like to point out <sighs> that I think people who argue blockchain but not Bitcoin um, missed the key insight that, in my perspective, um, Bitcoin is still one of the killer applications for exactly what blockchain technology is providing. Um, and it, it's, it's so good in many ways, also from a techno technology standpoint, um, it's well tested, it has a network effect going on, and for, for, for this reason I really care about Bitcoin and uh, about the whole idea because I think it, it sensibilizes us for the core idea of like a trustless economy and what, what decentralization actually means and what, what does it give to us because for many other examples, if you talk about uh, other projects, um, other ICOs going on or something, sometimes it's really hard to grasp the idea what, what's actually, what is actually changing. So they throw around words like trustless. I do so, so myself. But what does it mean for those projects? It's sometimes hard to grasp. But if you understand Bitcoin, <laughs> Because it's it like, helps. Yeah, it's like the pure nature. Yeah. Uh, it's like the killer application. It's like the pure mathematical foundation for this concept. And um, it's not only about understanding these concepts, but it also it, it brings so much value to the world as, as great application. I won't overly agree with you because I'm supposed to be slightly combative in a lovely, war, you know, loving way, but uh, Eric, you're can right. I, can um, I ask a question? Yes, please do. I'm going to put you in a very uncomfortable position. Eric, what is good? Because oh, <laughs> that's unfair a little that's bit. Good. <laughs> I, uh, I'm that's good. I'm going to a lot. When, when, I, when I try to cook my mother's food and then she says, it's all right, that's amazing. Oh, okay, that is <laughs> right? an amazing so answer. <laughs> the, the feeling I get when... Because she's like too old and can't, you know, so the feeling I get when she can say, oh, this is this and that's that, as if she cooked it, but I did, then I think that's good. <laughs> Sorry, that's just a very personal anecdote. There's no yeah. way I'm going to answer that, but thanks for trying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we're now going to get a, a drill down into it a little bit, which is um, which social projects already exist that we can shine a light on and say, oh, that's, that's working or that's improving? Anybody got something, some ideas they want to contribute? Something I wanted to bring to the table um, is actually a science fiction story written by someone called Luke underscore Magnata that came out on Reddit in 2014. And the story was called, I am from the future and I am here to tell you to stop what you are doing. And it paints this really elegant and compelling portrait of Bitcoin in 50 years. And one of the things that he says is that, you know, Bitcoin is now owned by, partially by, like, the Saudi Arabian government, the Russian government, and that, you know, Bitcoin essentially went up to over a million dollars and all of these other things. It's, it's a really compelling read. But I think to bridge on that question of what is good and is Bitcoin good, we also have to look at, uh, through the actions of our relative consciousness or the consolidation of that consciousness into an institution, how does the principle of an invention align with the purpose of those who are using it? And I think when you have a disconnect of the core underlying principle and the purpose of those that are using the technology, um, that's when you experience a disconnect that only creates what I can call it a tipping point or a break. And I think the same thing happened really in, you know, American democracy, um, where you have a situation where you have a basically a, you know, repu federal republic and you are, you know, having people participate more often in voting as a consumer in a Keynesian economy of consumption than they are participating in their local elections or their, you know, federal national government. And when your theory of consum consumption is structured by a man named Edward Bernays, who happens to be the nephew of Sigmund Freud, who used um, essentially exploitation of the unconscious mind to drive consumption, when that's the active participation in society, then you're going to see a rise in the collective shadow represented by an electorate like perhaps Donald Trump. Uh, and so I think that this is all very psychological, even though Bitcoin is mathematical, really at the end of the day, an invention is the human response in action to what we create through our minds and our technology. So what is good? I think it's up to every person in this room to 
make sure that what you believe is good, what you believe is beautiful or true or right for yourself or for humanity, for what you believe is good to shine through in your actions. Ooh, so, let's try and give them some examples in that case. Yeah, so, yeah. Reese, you, you uh, in, why did you found Singular, why did you co-found or help found Singularity University? What was your goal there? And do you see projects that you support and assist with blockchain? Well, so the idea behind Singularity is, is to help people identify technologies that are changing fast in an exponential way, which are not easy to recognize or intuitive as to how they impact our daily lives or in, in the future. And so once you can identify those things like phones, which are getting more or less twice as good every year, if you use that kind of technology to solve problems at scale, your solution to the problem will naturally get better without extra work. And so if you use something like a phone to solve something like poverty or water supply or energy, the way that that problem is solved with the phone gets better as the phones get better. So that's an example of the kind of uh, technology helping solve problems that uh, Singularity tries to educate people about and teach them how to, how to do. And so that's kind of the, why that happened. And then uh, an example of something that's good that most people acknowledge is the internet, which is connecting everybody um, uh, in the world and in a consistent, standardized way. And most people would say that uh, uh, connecting everybody is a good thing, having it be the same for everybody is a good thing. And for me, uh, blockchain and Bitcoin are extensions to the internet. They're adding money and, and, and trust on the internet, which is also a good thing. And the, this subject of good and bad is, is in order for something to be good, semantically, there has to be bad. Because otherwise, how do you know whether something's good unless you have a reference to it? And so uh, for each of these things that are discussed as being good, well, they're relative to something that is bad. And that, as I mentioned earlier, the, the good and the bad is subjective depending on your point of view. So some people would say the internet is good for everybody, but other uh, people would say that well, it might be at risk of, of spreading ideas that are dangerous <coughs> or, or uh, risking to uh, an uh, organization or government that is trying to keep control, where if everything is connected, there's less ability to control that. So these good or bad are kind of dual use uh, <coughs> concepts, and uh, uh, and it's relative. You you mentioned that um, you're bringing or you're extending the internet with trust, and uh, I agree with that. But I wanted to also build on top of that to 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 show what this actually means. So usually in society, why do we organize in in communities and cities in in governments or whatever? The reason is because we have the same interests, we are an interest group, and because we see each other, we kind of we, we have the ability to build trust. So for this reason, we always organize in bigger and bigger societies, but there are still these borders. So what the internet already brought is you can communicate outside of these borders. So we, we had like communities, forums, um, Reddit, whatever. Everything is building up with uh, like enhancing communication between those parties. But s for certain applications, you just need trust, or you, you need like a government or something. So this was not able in the internet without giving out the control. So <clears throat> the internet has grown over the past decade with the assumption that we have to give out this trust to a central authority, and the central authority will, will bring us the possibility to organize us in a like trusted way, but we, we trust this central authority. And what, what blockchain is now enabling is you, you, can, <clears throat> you can have this organization peer-to-peer -peer just as like peer-to-peer -peer in person. Now we can organize groups. Also what you said, um, <clears throat> you mentioned that, um, that when, whenever you, you, whatever your belief is, you can organize yourself with others that have this belief and you don't have to rely on your neighbor having the same belief. Mm. And now you can, you can actually do this in a trustless way. <clears throat> and this is, the, yeah, just to, to give you an overview. Of I that. like that we've gone from what is good to what is trust. I love that we're not dealing with trivial things on this <laughs> panel. We're going for the, the, the real ones. But uh, actually, trust is a great one because... Uh, 
Personally, I think that we're like the last generation that are going to, you know, you know, our children and grandchildren are going to laugh at us because we used that internet thing, which had no trust built in. We had no idea whose website and whatever it was you were looking at. How could you do that? You know, it's like using rotary dial phones and things. <laughs> but um, the thing that's also relevant is transparency. And actually, Catherine, you touched on it a little bit because you said, I think that you see so many pictures, blockchain is for good, going to save the universe by fill in the blank, right? Yeah. But you also touched on a lack of transparency or actually that some people want to make money about this. Can we talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, well, actually, the thing is about the, the, the industry, there are different types of blockchain. There is public and private blockchain. And uh, the very interesting thing is that I've interviewed a lot of people and they use the... Well, blockchain is supposed to be transparent. The industry is supposed to bring transparency. But at the same time, there are private blockchains that some banks in Switzerland are trying right now. And so uh, transparency is good, uh, but it, let's be honest, it's not always good. I mean, if a bank has a lot of information about people, uh, why would why would just give it away to other people to see? I mean, would you guys agree? That, would you would you would you like another people and the clients of the same bank bank to know your data? How much transparency are we talking about? Well, I would say I'd rather be anonymous and have that information be public so it could be a resource for everyone to use. If we're really saying that data is the new oil and we're changing our mentality from this extraction from Earth and or an extraction from people into something that's open source for everyone, I would say to use uh, like medical, not even just medical records, but medical information, right? Even like DNA, like would I feel comfortable knowing that my DNA or my data or my medical information was held in a way that was anonymous or pseudo-anonymous, fragmented into multiple identities, but that that data was actually an open source resource wow. for the but, world but to still, use. But still an anonymous, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still anonymous, broke, broken into that you could take my one identity, even break that into multiple identities, but still have that information as a raw file be something that's owned by the planet. I think that's an important resource for the growth and evolution of the human race. It really. is. But yeah. if you're anonymous, are you transparent? That is the question I've been, I've been thinking about. Well, it depends, doesn't it? Um, Let's try experiment here. Let's yeah. do something that probably, <laughs> I have to say, that's probably you and I will remember. It's a word called a mashup, right? Let's take, um, let's take uh, Andreas' solution, uh, mash it up with a bank, and allow ourselves to trust them sufficiently to give them our DNA, right, in Tony's example, right? And then if that is used for medical research, if the bank said, you know, I you know, I'm a bank. Trust me, I look after your your DNA. You know, it's it's a, it's a great pitch, right? If as long as they're using your stuff, I know they'll be sharing with me the use and the value of my DNA when it's used for medical research. But they don't have to know who I am, and do I trust the centralized bank to look after that? Reese, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, at, at the moment, we do trust the centralized organizations to uh, protect the information. Uh, but the inter I would say privacy is an illusion, that we think we have privacy and we trust organizations to keep that privacy, but the uh, analytics techniques of uh, intelligence agencies and so forth is designed to pierce through that privacy. And we can anonymize things in a way that we think is secure, like saying, uh, my name is anonymous, uh, but... I'm this guy sitting on this uh, discussion at this time in this location, and that you can cross-reference that with the program and, and identify my name. So where I, I thought I was adequately secure in anonymizing myself, it, it's actually just an illusion that I had that's easily uh, pierced through. And so some of these things that uh, uh, we're hoping of anonymity, uh, we can't really depend on long-term. Uh, for example, the, the personal genome project uh, out of Harvard, which has sequenced uh, many people's uh, genomes, uh, very carefully anonymized the name of the person from the genome sequence. But uh, it's, it's already been demonstrated by knowing that genome sequence, you can uh, calculate um, backwards uh, fairly accurately uh, over 70% to uniquely identify that person based on just the genetic information. Um, and so some of these things that are set out to be anonymous 
maybe, maybe years later, maybe shortly after, uh, can be reverse engineered to pierce through that anonymity. I'd like to, in, in that case, go to the concept of identity and sovereignty. Now, there's someone on the panel who knows a little bit about this. Tony, I'm going to ask you to, <laughs> to share about it because you, you did blow my mind a little bit. Can I just say that you are, call, you are called the Joan of Arc of blockchain, right? Can I just tell you, you should just own that because... Uh, you, you, it's, it's okay. It's not too bad. <laughs> um, there are worse things, I promise. But sure. tell us about sovereignty and the idea. Uh, well, tell us about what you're working on in sovereignty. So the way I really look at this, and this is really something that's been worked on for 20 years. This is a community that's stewarded by Christopher Allen, who's the co-author of TLS and SSL. They're the encryption standards for the internet. So you go into your Gmail, you click the little drop-down box next to someone's name, you see a little lock that says TLS. So Chris is the co-author of that standard. He was also the principal architect at a company called Blockstream until very recently when he left to work on this full-time. And so Web of Trust is essentially an open-source standard that allows for individual sovereignty to be stewarded by the community. It really has a lot of principles of First Nations. So if you own your identity, rather than saying, I have a third party who I trust to own my identity, whether that's me being assigned my passport from a nation or a medical card or etc., it's really you saying, I trust my community to steward who I am, to, to really give me my identity and my reputation based on the interactions I have with the world around me that knows me, the way that I contribute to that world meaningfully. So for example, if you are or a refugee, if you're just a person in the world, you can say, you know, I know that this person is who they says they are because I've known them for seven months and I can create a claim that they have skills as a carpenter and as an English teacher because we've been building homes together in this disaster area for the last seven months and they've been helping my children learn English. And so if you live outside of the bounds of a traditional nation and you are applying for citizenship, the current process is basically like a lottery because there's no context engine. And, and this, beyond just our relationship to blockchain, actual contextual understanding is the next level of understanding meaning and importance in data and information. And from my perspective, for the benefit of you know, the research for the next 50 years, work for the next 50 years, it is of the utmost importance that we standardize this as an open source process and protocol. You can build an infinite number of economies on top of this, and in fact some people are, right? The standards that have been DIDs, decentralized identifiers, standards that um, our community has created and stewarded are now being used by the largest open source blockchain projects, Uport, Sovereign, these are all members who are a part of our community coming together to create something unified. So for all of this innovation and for all of this invention, we have a singular thread somewhere that's binding us together for at least consistency in the complexity that is this wealth of information. Tony, could you help us understand then maybe sure. uh, how, I love the idea of an attestation by a community that the trust for a person or a, an identity exists. I kind of like that. Um, how is that then accessible to, say, a refugee? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's basically community stewardship. It's actually just having a mobile phone. I mean, if you can send a text message. That's the can... minimum technology layer, which, by the way, is yeah. pretty awesome these days, right? Yeah. So pretty supercomputer in your hand. Yeah, so absolutely. That, so, so if you were... Let's just say you're running a country. I, won't, I don't suspect that isn't going to happen. With a bit of luck, it probably will happen one day. But let's just say you're <laughs> running a country, uh, Tony Land. And in Tony Land, right, you have a refugee problem. What do you do to ameliorate that refugee problem? How do you empower them? Well, I wouldn't actually say it's a refugee problem. I would say it's a context problem. Okay. So, for example, if someone's coming into a country and you have no information about them, it might be hard for them to get a job. Because you can't go somewhere and see someone say, oh, well, I can see that you know, you've built a house before. You can claim to have built a house, but you can't really get a job on a claim or an attestation without verified proof or a verified credential. And so it's really the ability for you to have verified credentials in your social network, and then beyond that, verified credentials from institutions as well. So if you then get a verified credential as, you know, you're a person that exists, verified by your community as the, having the capability to do these things, then maybe you have a job at an institution. And this institution can then provide you with a verified institutional uh, credit. 
for saying that you've accomplished this task or you've done this thing or you have this citizenship. And so really this network works through both a system of your verified peers and a system of verified institutions interoperably. Interesting. There's, um, there's yeah, a problem please. with that yeah. verification and especially if it's immutable where if your history as being a <coughs> refugee is, well, you were a terrorist in this previous country and you yeah. currently were diagnosed as having Ebola in the country after that, and now you're coming into this new country, and you may want that information to be forgotten. In fact, the EU is, has created a, uh, legislation to the right to be forgotten, where the, the things that might give you a job, also that same information would be bad, bad thing, uh, don't allow this person in or, or don't give them a job. And, th and so the, the, the way that even the internet and, and large of society works now is, is a lot of those things aren't uh, easily remembered and they are forgotten and so people kind of sneak through the system. But once you put it on a blockchain, especially a public blockchain, the information is unchangeable. And even if you say it was incorrect, the record says, well, it happened, but then it was changed to be incorrect. So it's still there. And so these kind of histories of, uh, um, become uh, your permanent record. And so some of the things that may be accidental but are bad on your record can affect you in the future in ways that you can't fix. And this society hasn't really dealt with this historically, and, uh, and it's going to be a problem in the future. So I have an answer to this, um, which is actually the most complex and important part of what we're working on. And it's the idea that we've designed justice in the current state of justice is totally wrong. Justice is not black and white. People are not good or bad. People are human beings with a series of subjective experiences. And if we really want to reform, smart contracts are all about reforming the legal system. If we really want to reform our perception of law, then we need to begin to restore each other. So the next layer of what we think about for our basis of identity is not necessarily reputation, because I think reputation is a moniker, is basically like good or bad, like you don't have enough points, so you cannot fly on a plane, rather than saying, let's really look at this from a perspective of restoration and community restoration. So that's actually the single most complex part of what we're working on and the thing that I am the single most excited about. And that's actually where a lot of the knowledge from these First Nations and indigenous communities are, are coming in, in terms of how do we appropriately steward an identity to say, you know, perhaps someone has done something and, and maybe that thing is looked on as a community, whether it's your community or a community of your peers as not being acceptable. Rather than saying, let's go through and like shame this person and cause them harm and make them experience consequence for their actions. It's having that person understand that the con their, their action will be seen. But through that action being seen, how do we heal the root of that problem? Rather than just forcing people into survival situations, that's what we're doing now. That's very... Well, well, so, so, so if somebody yeah. is infected with a pandemic disease like Ebola, you should say, well, it would be more socially just to allow them on the plane uh, because it would be nicer for, you know, let's ignore their, their facts and the history and let them uh, no, infect the plane. Not, infect no, the not even remotely what I was, not okay. even remotely close to what Perhaps I was. I misunderstood them. No, not even that's. No, that has, it had nothing, nothing to do with saying, let's create this arbitrary social context and then be ignorant to facts and information around an arbitrary social context that says people are good, and because people are good, let's just put other people at risk because well, it people could be are a, generally a good. Person good. No. with an infectious disease. Yeah, no, no, no. It has nothing to do with good or bad. It has to do with the nature of restoration and the relationship to the person's reality. So maybe the reality is that you have Ebola, and maybe because that is your current state of being, maybe you can't fly on a plane. I'm talking about more human actions, like the idea of I have a whole um, section that I've written out in one of our white papers about this, but it's the idea that maybe someone has done something that's perceived as socially bad, right? Like maybe someone went through a really like messy personal situation and maybe that situation became public and maybe they were socially shamed because of the way that they decided to live their life. And, you know, maybe they were trapped in an unhappy situation and maybe they did the thing that they did that they're so shamed for, um, because they, you know, have this other underlying root issue that isn't being addressed. It's really saying, let's address, in our perspective of human identity, we really need to understand how to use justice as a mechanism of restoration, rather than saying this is black or white. There are black and white situations, like if someone is in infected with, if someone has a highly infectious disease, or they a should not or fly a on a plane. Or a yeah. That's what I was going to ask, so the personal yeah. story does matter. Yeah. 
But if we only have data which is anonymous, it's yep. transparent, transparent but anonymous, how do we know what person is good or bad? Or yep. maybe a person has changed. Maybe something happened in the past. So does this, the personal story matter? How do you define that? Shared meaning, right? It's context. Like if you think about community, like the way that we align ourselves with the people that we surround ourselves with or that we're closest with, it's based on the idea of how do we create shared meaning together? And if we're going to create shared meaning together, most of our shared meaning is based on missing an entire layer of context, which is the human element, which is really how do we restore? People are saying, let's basically solve a problem by ending it at a zero-sum game. And I don't think that's an actual solution. I think that's our way of propagating ideals of our relationship to each other that say, we are separate. I am separate from you and you and you, but we're not. We're actually all connected in a way that's far more beautiful, complex, and interdynamic than we could ever even imagine. We live in a fabric of each other. Do you know what this panel makes me feel like there's hope for this country and the rest of us. I love that <laughs> these people are working on these kind of problems. Um, Andres, I wanted to ask you about something related to that. One thing that can be good and bad for you is your credit details, right? Yeah. Who has a right to own that in your world? Yeah, uh, that's a really interesting question. We had a brief discussion uh, already. And um, it, it's, it's uh, very, very important to have the insight that in, somehow, in some way it's data about you. So probably someone generated it, but it's also related to you. So in our solution, what we say is certainly someone can generate data about you, but then it's a service by them for you. So what they do is they enrich your identity in the sense like what, what you know about yourself or what you can let others know about yourself. So they have done a service to you, but of course you cannot um, require them to always like delete this information. If they observe this information about you, it's also kind of their data. So in our model, we also say everyone is incentivized, everyone is like gets a share of of this work that they performed. So um, I think it's kind of a middle ground and it's a really, really tough question to answer in the end, but I think you have an opinion too. Yeah, well, so if, if this data is, for example, your FBI criminal record or your social credit score in China or things that are collected by a government agency or a corporation about you, you didn't opt into it, you, you didn't uh, even contribute the data to them, they figured it out about you. So it's data totally intimately about you, but it's not your data, it's just data that's about you that somebody else constructed and created. And so the ability to say, well, I'd like to change these details in my FBI record or change these things in my credit report, well, you can't really do uh, because it's not your data and, and, and it's objectively accurate in, in their point of view. So these kind of things, uh, like the concept of saying, um, you know, I, I'm giving my data to this social network, and, but that's my data. Uh, however, they're constructing the data too. You voluntarily gave it to them, just like we volunteered to be uh, on this stage speaking. So now you have data about us that we gave to you, and your possession of it is yours. And maybe what I said is, is something I said, but I volunteered to, um, to give it away. Yeah, but the yeah. question is probably how much have you contributed to make this disable? I mean, well, obviously so you can pass So an FBI contribute. criminal record, you probably committed a criminal act to volunteer yourself into that database. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> you know, should, should you get compensated if they do something about that? But what if they're wrong? Where's the redress? I'd like the yeah. concept of restoration and perhaps yeah. a societal rule that allows us to do that. Is that even possible? Is it a dream? I Is it possible today? Something I want to just point out that I'm really big on that I think with this, like you are, you're saying you're volunteering your data. There has to be a process of someone understanding their right to consent. And I think most people that are volunteering their data, they have no relationship to consent. And so most people that are consenting their data, they're not really understanding that they are consenting yeah. because they're not seeing. So I think the actual making people aware of their right to consent and that you have no is a powerful word. You have the right to say no. And this is something we're seeing happen now, but I think before GDPR, 
most people weren't aware that they, they even had the right to say, no, I don't want to do this, because it wasn't something that was really, their, people's rights were not effectively given to them at that point in time. There wasn't a consciousness. And do I think it's possible? It has to be. It has to well, be. You, that's not practically true. I mean, you can't say, no, I don't want to have a credit report. I don't want to have a social credit score in China. I don't like my criminal record, so please erase it. That you can maybe opt out of something like a credit report, I mean, but then if you want to yeah. you know, buy a house or get a credit card or do anything financial and you have opted out or invisible from a, a credit score, well, you're no longer really a citizen in that commerce world. Correct. And so it, it's... Um, but for things like criminal records, you can't opt out of that. It's, it's part of your public record. So in Sweden, when you murder someone, um, they sit you down with every single person who is affected by the person that you killed, their entire family, their friends, and they sit all of those people down in front of you and they cry in front of you, and you have a conversation with them after you murder someone. So that's actually a working example of how some of these processes of restoration might work for something that's extreme in a criminal sense like murder. And the reoffense rate is amazingly low and very in low. Sweden. And yeah. they have the lowest cost of incarceration, I think, in any country in the world because yeah. of approaches like that. Do we know what the numbers are like for the USA, or should we just not go there today? It's just... <laughs> But how do you <laughs> it, it gives you reason to get another gun. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is one of the but, biggest industries but, here. But, yeah. So, so, but the thing yeah. is about, about uh, the question, which data do we want to store? If you store less data, you probably say, oh, we just only store the most important data bits, but then you lose context. The more data you add to that, the more to the objective reality you, you come. But we have to realize that we cannot store all data because... For that, you, have, you would have to live the life of the person to basically understand what objectively happened within his life. So there is a middle ground that we have to find, and that's already something we are doing. So we kind of st store some data, but then the context is kind of gone. But then we have the subjective other perspectives that you were mentioning, like other parties are subjectively summarizing their view on their their perception of the context um, and storing their, this data on their side. So it's kind of it's kind of um, tackling this problem for, from two sides and and putting it into like a minimal understanding, a minimal piece that someone could understand or. Don't you think there's process. a problem of being biased if you're saying that another party is? Oh, gathering? It, it, it certainly is a problem, uh -huh. but you have to realize that the perfect solution is not there. It, it will not be there because you cannot like store everything. You would probably... So it's just an, 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 another way of gathering data with different parties and different views, but it's not unbiased, right? No, 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 no it's, it's not. I mean, referring to, to the problem that we just re referred, like, yeah, you, you, you're trying to, to tackle this problem. You, you're trying to, to get a, a smaller bit of information that you can process. You cannot record someone's life and then always objectively say what what happened or do you think what you can happen? give an example if you said some data we gather some data is it is it is it a, a, oh, like a, the a case that happened or a medical record or no i mean like the credit rating or something or the fbi yeah. record so that's the subjective um, perception of their it's their summary of what happened for a specific topic so you're assuming that at Probably FBI is biased toward a oh, it, potential Oh, it certainly is biased, kernel. but it's like the best guess we and probably who didn't, have. I'm, I'm just really interested in who then this, this, the third party that is going to uh, gather all the data and give their perspective. Is it citizens? Is it government? Or In this particular case. No, I mean, uh, anyone can be that, but the thing is, uh, the question is who will read this data and whether the, the reader of this data relies on what this subjective... Um, Perhaps going forward, it might be one of Tony's sovereign communities where we all have a voice and decide, somehow using anonymity to prevent personal identity. Use for ZK snarks after all. Um, <laughs> just to say, <laughs> sorry, Why that, after that was all? so tough. Sorry, I didn't mean that. Love, love it. Amazing technology. Catherine, can you give us some data? Um, can I just say that uh, I. Love the curated part of Cointelegraph. I have become to rely on it too much. It's a bit like a drug. Thank so you. awesome edit editing. Um, but the responsibility of that is huge, right? Because it influences so much. Um, whether you like it or not, you, you, know, you, you need to brace it. So give us some numbers. How many, at the moment, uh, stories and pieces come in that have a purpose or social good? 
using blockchain? Uh, to be percentage? honest and to give my personal opinion, not many. Uh, I not think enough. We, not That's many. Um, we mostly cover, you know, the market side sure. of it, the cryptocurrencies and trust me, we want to hear all of that. I think I would say ten percent of all all the stories. Ten percent at the yeah. moment. Yeah. Okay. But and the market I, I, is kind of the incentive player. For bringing people in, right? So I know, I, I, I know, but there are there are projects that are doing something, and we covered them in a sponsored way. I have to be discreet here as a journalist, but uh, there is so so little to talk about in terms of social impact and people doing something for for, for the better future. There is like 10 percent that would be data. Now, do you remember the, the uh, we, we sometimes on these panels we ask people what their um, awakening moment was in blockchain? Mine was one of the oh. early Bitcoin core developers sitting me down in 2011, 2012, oh, wow. explaining how, yes, he's cool. enjoying Bitcoin, going to make some money, etc. But I asked him, so how can it really be useful? And he said, well, think about this. He, he's doing some work in Africa. He said, there are despotic regimes in Africa when there's regime change. If you've qualified as a doctor or a nurse, your qualification disappears. This allows us to internationally mm -hmm. attest that you are a doctor and nurse. And so regardless of what happens, you can continue. You, you're not stopped. So very simple. It's immutability. And I thought, ka I'm so in there. And I thought that was lovely. So well, just quickly, before we go to the Q&A, what was your happening? Oh, mine was uh, certainly much more technical than yours. <laughs> <Bounty>. <laughs> I was just like reading the, the white paper or a summary. And I was just baffled like how people on different sides of the world can agree that they change the number so it's your money now. Like, yeah. we have two tables. I have a one on my table and a zero for, for, uh, on yours. And now we agree, okay, we changed this number, but I don't trust you. It's like and magic. How does yeah, that happen? Yeah, it's complete it's magic, ma isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> and this was the moment for me. Oh, I like that. Reese? Uh, well, I think um, it's an extension of the way things should happen that if I send you something on the Internet... You, I should trust that you're going to get it. And, the, and that has been working for decades. And so uh, getting a little bit of confirmation that you did get it and what you got, uh, we can both verify that is what I sent. Well, that's an improvement. And so that's kind of uh, not a... Not a happening, magic. but it's the reason <laughs> for you. that it's exciting. Uh, my story might be a little bit different of how I got into blockchain. And just to kind of comment on what you're saying with the being able to keep your verified credential for a medical professional, something else very similar you can do with Web of Trust is if you're in Israel, I don't know if you guys know this, you're not allowed to get married if you live in Israel unless you are a, a part of the core religion in Israel, my friends have to fly to Cyprus or somewhere, get married there, and then come back to Israel so their marriage is recognized. And on our technology, you can actually just say, go to another country or do this online. Did and, you know and about your... blockchain weddings where you can sign yeah. up for 10 years, not auto-renew? <laughs> kind of interesting, Yes, that, right? actually, you can set... So, no, you can, do, you can do exactly that. You can say, we have an agreement, a love agreement. That love agreement lasts for five years, and after five... Or a year. And after this year is over, we have a renewal period. And if we're still happy in the arrangement, then... And you can also have your love arrangements tied up in a way that doesn't necessarily associate every asset that you own with the arrangement of a domestic partnership. Wow. You, you can link those, but you don't have to. So... Um, that's another thing that on the technology that you're capable of doing that has some really interesting political applications. I got into blockchain after I was a performance artist for most of my life. So um, my work is about the human relationship to consciousness is something that exists outside of your own subjective body. So really using consciousness as a medium is my work in that field. Uh, and I got into blockchain because when you deconstruct the whole world, you realize that everything that exists around us, our phones, our shirts, these lamps, the chairs, they're all just an evolved thought and a little bit of human ingenuity and figuring out how to take what exists materially and create something out of it. But once you break all that down, none of these structures exist. And that's really the true nature of reality beyond what we see materially. And once you deconstruct <coughs> material reality, really, for a few years, um, when you kind of start to reintegrate back into the world, the questions you were at least I started asking myself are, okay, what are the systems that actually structure the underlying logic of the way that we as humans organize? So studied politics, economics, and philosophy, and that was what, in Austin, Texas, and that was what led me into... <laughs> Bitcoin. It's always Austin, Austin Texas. It's always there Austin. is a big There's community a lot going there. On there. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Catherine, uh, your answer is going to make my answer 
sound so dull. No Thank way. you. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, it's much more not, not that excited. I was working for a fintech company and I was following the markets, and so I have two those two of those moments. So I was researching about what's happening in the fintech industry because we're working we're working with the artificial intelligence for trading platforms and what it can do. And so I was really excited. I know it sounds dull, but no, it's very no interesting. Yeah. Trust me, we're, we're doing a new thing on trade at the moment. We're <laughs> loving it. So yeah. and and I really love. I, I heard about it and I start researching. And I was I was very you know impressed by the crypto by a new crypto asset that you can trade, and we were working on uh, integrating the cryptocurrency trading into the platform. But the next moment, um, it's actually the very core. Um, uh, I, you know, I was I was comparing what's going on with the national currencies, uh, and if something bad happened with the economy or po politics or there is war in the way. Uh, citizens are suffering from inflation. Citizens are uh, subject to huge uh, volatility of the national currency. And uh, so, and with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, uh, I love the fact that it's not backed by anything. So if it goes down, that would be only me who will who lose something? Well, that 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 makes me wonder about my cryptocurrency trading choices, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it yeah. doesn't mean that the whole world will fall, and so that was my second moment. <laughs>